everyone. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we have a very special guest. This is Ryan Beard. And today we're going to explore the way they think, who they are, and how they came to their conclusions. Ryan, can you introduce yourself to my audience and give them a little idea of who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm Ryan Beard. I am a commentary YouTuber, I guess, would be my main job at the moment. Uh, I would also consider myself a comedian. Mm. Uh, I haven't done a ton of comedy recently, but I've done a lot of like improv stuff. And uh, I was on like America's Got Talent a few years ago for comedy and stuff. Uh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Oh, you, you didn't know about no, that? I yeah, didn't I did know like that. Mus- I did musical comedy on America's Got Talent uh, <laughs> cool. a few years back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to get back into doing like more comedy stuff because the commentary can become uh, pretty draining. Um, but yeah, I'd say comedian, commentary, YouTuber. That's I love that. Idea. You know, I struggle so much with what I am. People are always like, what do you do? And it's like, um, I don't, I make content, you know, but when I watch your content, yeah. I'm aware that you have a vibe. You're sending out a signal. You're giving me professionalism, but with a pointed idea, like I know you're taking me on a journey from beginning to end. Why did you mm-hmm. decide to go in that direction with your content? Um, well, I, in the beginning, like, I know that I, like, wear a suit in my videos. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, wearing the suit was actually kind of more of a, a joke um, mm. because I was doing, like, musical comedy stuff, and then I was wearing the suit to kind of contrast with kind of how ridiculous the songs I was doing were. Yeah. But then over time, I think, yeah, my content has kind of shifted in more of, like, a political direction and more of a... Uh, kind of video essay type content yeah. so now it, it doesn't really feel like the suit is a joke anymore it kind of feels like it's just me trying to come across as like a uh, professional I guess but yeah um, yeah I don't know I, I think I really the answer to why I wear the suit is just to give me something that differentiates myself mm. so that when someone clicks on the video it kind of feels different than you know yeah. what you would usually expect I guess Well, I'm curious then, because one of the things that I do when I watch content creators, and this is like a fault of mine, but also it's just what it is. I like things, but I never really deep dive into people or like why they like why they're doing what they do. I just watch what they give me. And if I have time, I try to do that. But I never like Google people. I'm not a Googler. I just like to enjoy whatever people present to me. So I was kind of over the last uh, I don't know when I started to watch your stuff or when I know we have some people in common like Papa Gut and stuff and he recommended you to me as a person to talk to because he thinks you're awesome and I you know I I agree that your content really speaks to me in a lot of ways I think we have different goals with our life but I think that the way you think is so egalitarian so similar to me that I'm like oh this is cool. You have this egalitarian mm-hmm. idea about the world. You have this idea that we should be sort of, don't let me project, but maybe efficient in how we socialize and do things. Is that a word you would use for yourself or compassionate maybe? So. Even like efficient yeah. compassion? Yeah, I I would say my end goal is like I want people to be able to get along with each other mm. and for us to move past all the kind of tribalism that we get stuck in and yeah, I would consider myself a, a leftist, like politically, but in the my end goal is absolutely egalitarianism. Like, I just want us all to be on an yeah. equal playing field and for us all to just, yeah, treat each other with a bit more empathy. But then it's difficult because when you're trying to, like, treat people with, like, empathy and respect, but then someone is putting out something that you think is, like, kind of, uh, I guess, hateful, Mm -hmm. then, like, how do you respond to that? Because if you respond with, like, too much empathy to that, then people can be like, oh, you're coming across as, like, weak. But then if you you respond with, like, too, like, uh, too harsh to them, then people are like, oh, you claim that you're against hate, but then you're being hateful to this hateful person. Yeah, so Mm -hmm. it's kind of difficult to, to walk that line, you know? I think we all struggle with it. I actually am frustrated with it, I think, at the moment personally, where I I have two ways of thinking of the world personally. I think of my own values and how to judge people through the lens of those. And then I have their values. How do I judge them through the lens of their values? Do they walk the walk? Mm. How do you – like? and I'm asking you a very like personal question, so feel free not to answer it, but like, how do you think of – people what are they doing here on the planet what are you doing here on the planet what do we have an obligation to be good to each other like what's your philosophy or belief about our existence oh damn yeah big questions (laughs) um i think that meaning is is something that we kind of all create for ourselves and i think um 
I guess I don't necessarily believe that like we have to try to make the planet. Mm. I, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like if we all have this short amount of time that we're spending on earth, why not spend it trying to like make things better for the future people mm -hmm. and trying to like spend it, making it as like <laughs> making it not miserable for the time that we do get to spend here and the people yeah. that we interact with. Cause I think that, you know, hate just kind of leads to cycles and you know it just kind of makes everyone feel like shit you know yeah so okay here's what I'm curious about because like I watch your content I watch my content I watch other people in our sphere and I know we're all doing different things with different goals I know my goal personally is to make content because I like to talk to people I jumped over being a radio host when I was a kid and now I get to do this right so close enough that works mm -hmm. for me I'll take it thank you universe like I'll take it but I'm not really here to make the world a better place. I would argue that I'm here to make people's lives better using tools that work for people with brains similar to mine. Or I'm hoping that people who have different brains than me can at least take something of interest from my work and then throw away the rest. That doesn't work for them, right? So I have mm. this very like focused solution for I think the world's problems, which I really I'm not convinced we'll solve. So I think my focus got narrower and narrower as I left politics and, and activism. So why do you think like you've gone down this road, I feel from the way I watch your content of actually trying to help the bigger picture more than even the micro? Do you think that you have kind of a more um, individualistic perspective on things and less of trying to view like the larger systems and more mm. just kind of focusing in on um, people individually, you would say? Yeah, definitely. I think I tried working with systems, but I felt like they were so inefficient. It was really f impacting my mental health. And so I decided, mm. well, how do I help somebody like me who has this like desire to like help the world? And I think I am the best when I'm helping individuals. And you think that you can help individuals best by kind of trying to meet them where they are and sort of empathizing with where they're at rather than trying to kind of convince them of changing their worldview or something like that yeah for sure well I just know I don't want to be changed on mine <laughs> and yeah. I really like mine and I worked really hard to find this amount of joy in my life and I have everything I need from existence like thank you so when other people try to come into my life to change me it's like no no no. I already did it I already found what I needed and I understand for you it might seem harmful but to me I'm trying my best to harm reduce so I know I'm not perfect but yeah I think I, I think I strongly believe in the individual just because I've never found a system that quite worked for me yeah, I think I'm a, a bit different to that where I do um, feel like I am constantly evolving because mm. when I was when I was younger, I uh, was grown in uh, I grew up in like a conservative household. Uh, I was like a homeschooled conservative kid. Same. Um, I was homeschooled too oh, in a really? conservative bubble. Yeah. Like until I was 15. Oh, no way. Until I was 15 yeah. and I got two years of public school. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. No, same here. That's so funny. I, uh, I was homeschooled up until I was like 16 and then I went to community college Literally. for the last few years oh. of high school. Yeah. Oh, you are a smart one. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> That's awesome. Not, not, I didn't know really. we had that sort not of in really. common. That's just like what a lot of uh, homeschooled kids yeah, do. Yeah, it's they, true. Uh, it's true. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. Wait, can I ask, was it conservative politically or conservative religiously? Was there religion involved? Um. Yeah, I would say it's interesting. Uh, it, it, I would say my parents are mostly conservative because of their religion is what yeah. I would say is my mom has actually moved kind of more into being a liberal as she gets older. Mm, uh, cool. And I, and I feel like my parents have always come from a place of that. The reason they are Christians or the reason they relate with Christianity is because of the message of Jesus telling people to like love everyone mm. and to treat people with respect and all that. Um, so I feel like they are a good example of Christians who I would consider like really walk the walk as far as like what Jesus's messages are. Cool. And then I think I get frustrated kind of seeing people twisting Jesus's messages to um, promote things that wouldn't really be in line with what I would consider mm. like biblical, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting because I, you know, I grew up really staunch Catholic. My parents are immigrants from Iraq. So we're, we newly immigrated to the States probably in the forties, I think. Or 50s, it was kind of Kennedy time, a little bit before technically. But it was around that era where like there was a shift in American culture. A lot of things were happening. And my parents, their family slowly just came over here. But religion was like a key point of community. And they were Catholic. So when they came here, mm -hmm. they found a lot of Catholic communities to mold with. A lot of Catholic homeschooling communities. 
Yeah. And so all of my friends were homeschooled except for the neighborhood kids and a lot of the people I grew up with. We grew up in a community of like um homeschooling like homeschooling families. So we would go and see them and socialize and stuff. But eventually mm-hmm. as I was coming uh coming up and growing up as a closeted queer kid in a conservative home, I started to like pop my bubbles and realize like okay, wait a second. My parents feel very scary to me right now. But I know they're good people and I know they love me. So why do I feel so abandoned? And it was because of their belief differences. Mm. The way they saw queer people and then the way I felt and identified as a small child, I'm like, I don't feel that way. That doesn't sound like me. And so there was a Mm. lot of misunderstanding about what it meant to be a good person growing up. It really confused me. So I'm curious, when you think of what a good person is, do you have like a definition for that? Um, I would say generally like, uh not i mean i i just generally don't like bigotry i guess you Mm. know just kind of making assumptions about someone because of like their you know inherent characteristics Mm. or the group that they're a part of um and i feel like that goes even in ways where like i don't think we should make you know assumptions about someone just because they're like white or a man either like i I feel like but you know, that's I think that bigotry obviously has had more harm towards uh, minority communities historically. But yeah, um, but yeah, because that is that kind of comes into moral relativism where um, the Christian perspective of what it means to be a good person would be following the word of God mm. as closely as possible, or at least that's what a lot of Christians would think. Um, but yeah, it, it is tough to like f- um, create your like a new moral framework and new worldview once you leave that religious yeah um like because things are so cut and dry for your entire life and then you have to leave and then explore the entire possibilities of what you know what it means to be a moral person so yeah I think I'm still still wrestling with that for sure Absolutely. I think that was the biggest struggle of my literal existence since I was like a child. What is a good person? Am I a good person? Does my orientation change that I'm a good person? Does my, you know, my parents' immigration status change that they're good people? Are they weird? Are we weird? And I know we're a very weird family. I mean, being homeschooled or having, you know, 10 kids was very strange and that was us. And at the same time, Mm -hmm. I feel so normal every day that I'm not sure – that there is a weird so much as just a difference of bubble or culture or upbringing. And so I, you know, considering your background and the way you've explored yourself online, do you consider yourself a normal person? A normal person? Uh, I don't think I'd consider myself a normal. I think normal is a pretty uh, kind of subjective term. I feel like normal just kind of depends on where the culture is at mm. any given time. Like the views I have might not be normal now, but they could potentially be normal 50 years from now. For sure. Uh, I don't think I'm I don't think I'm normal because I would consider my political beliefs more far left than like the the typical Overton window of American politics. And then, mm. you know, being uh, like bi and non-binary wouldn't necessarily be considered normal either. So I'd say probably no. Um, but as far as just being a I try to be like a friendly down to earth person. And I guess I would hope that I'm normal in that way. Um, yeah. But. Mm. But yeah, I um, I don't know. I, I feel like I've gotten so wrapped up in kind of responding to things and giving my opinions on Twitter, um, which just gives people a very uh, it gives people a very warped perception of you as a person because yeah. all that they see of you is you like kind of criticizing people or giving your takes of why you think something is wrong and then they kind of form this idea of you that you're the person who always is just criticizing everything and is never like happy or never like just having a down to earth conversation with someone. So that's kind of something I've been worrying about recently is like, how do I get myself out of this bubble of just, and I feel like this is something a lot of content creators go through of kind mm-hmm. of getting a uh, Twitter brand, you know? <laughs> I, I'm not even gonna pretend like I will write a tweet out so angrily like someone accused me of doing something the other day I was like oh and then I was like delete 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 yeah. delete delete yeah. and then I'll write it and I'm like <laughs> and then I'll do it like I did like seven times I was like my brother was yeah. we were playing smash he's like Brittany put down the phone I was like oh, but this guy this guy and I was like 
Because like I get accused of the weirdest things and I'm like, oh my God, that is not what I'm trying to say. But at the same time, mm. I really recognize, first I'm neurodivergent. I grew up super strange compared to the bubble I was raised in. And at the same time, I feel normal. So I'm always in this conflict of like, but I am normal. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not if you technically look at my history. Yeah. But I feel mm. like a normal person. I wake up like everyone else and I just go about my day. And so the idea that I'm somehow a threat to the standing or the America or the anything feels very strange to me. But I can understand by the way I talk. How I, people d- I deal with that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I deal with that a lot too, where I'm feeling like I'm just kind of trying to exist as myself. Like I don't see me existing as a threat. But then I understand that when people have constructed a worldview where this is what is normal and this is what is not normal. And if I'm outside of that, I just kind of am threatening that worldview. Yeah. So that's a hard thing to to deal with where you're just kind of sitting here like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything right now that should be threatening you. But it just kind of is how it is when people have a different moral framework than you. Absolutely. And then on top of that, I was really contemplating this morning, you know, all, all of these like it's obviously it's obvious that we have chaos and tension between thoughts and ideas and we're having like a real problem telling like who is safe and who isn't. And I think because the spectrum of safety is so different from all of us, for all of us, we really have to define it for ourselves. How do I feel safe in this space? And I know on the internet, I feel safe being a very authentic part of myself, but never my full, all encompassing whole self. Um, I also know that people who don't understand my language might hear me. I Do you know what spoon theory is? I don't, I don't know. I love spoon theory. It's for chronic illness and I use it all the time. And people are like, what are these spoons she's talking about? Right. Oh, like my spoons are feeling like I need to refill my spoons. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting because for me, I'm like, this is a great tool. I learned it. It's a language like tool. Like you should do it if you want to do it. And then people are like, that's silly. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is silly. Everything that we, everything that is a construct is almost like silly because we are just mm-hmm. making it up and making it work for ourselves. But I also think that's yeah. where all the freedom in my head came from after going through my nihilist stage in life. I realized, well, if nothing really matters, then the matter comes from the meaning of the individual. But the meaning of life, I think, is sort of all encompassing. It's that real lived experience of conflict and then solution, conflict and solution. So for me, I'm always interested in the solution, but I have a feeling that it's going to it's going to be not the way we thought it was going to be. And so I'm open to whatever it looks like. Are you open to the solution being – I don't want to use this word because it sounds like a like I'm insinuating something different. But what if the solution for our world is to like mind our business? Meaning that we can't make people actually think like us. We can only make people think better in their worldview. But then we have to kind of like – be a part a little bit or maybe just visit each other cool. like you know what i'm saying does that make, kind of make sense i know i'm sorry i used a lot of words i think yeah i i think there is some truth to the idea that if you try to just directly like if if i went to a very i don't know i think you have to this is a very difficult question to figure mm. out the answer to um I think change is a slow and gradual process. I don't think that you can come in, uh, talk to someone and just blow up their entire worldview. And then they can leave a conversation with you and say, oh, I've completely changed my perspectives on all this. You're totally right. Now I'm completely on your side. I feel like it's something where you kind of have to plant seeds of ideas in people's heads. And you, I think there is an element of you have to come across as, as not, a threat to them if you just Mm. come in and say um that your entire worldview is horrible then they're not necessarily going to listen to what you have to say yeah but then there's kind of the flip side where if someone is just doing something that's directly like threatening your community you can't always respond to that with like a ton of empathy sometimes you have to be more defensive and more protective Totally. Um, so that that's kind of how I view the world is like, if we want people to come over to our side of what we consider moral and ethical, you have to meet them where they are. And you have to try to like convince mm-hmm. them of what you're saying. But trying to convince people isn't always the correct tactic to deal with something. If someone is at your door with a gun, you're not gonna mm. like just be like, hey, let's talk and have a conversation and, yeah. you know, hug it out, you know, yeah. so it, it just kind of depends on the situation. Why are you like this? Like, why do you think like this? Why are you open to meeting people where they're at? I think because um, 
people were open to meeting me where I was at when I mm. was, you know, a conservative. Yeah. I think I I'm a leftist, but I don't like when other leftists are like, um, no, we just need to completely uh these are just fascists they're purely evil there's no because it, it's like people could have definitely said that about where i was at 10 yeah. years ago yeah um but because there were people who were able to like explain things to me and and meet me where i was at i was able to come to a place that i consider more of like an empathetic position now yeah um, there's um starting, yeah go ahead please did you finish your thought yeah i finished my thought okay cuz i grew up conservative and I grew up very politically minded. I was I was meeting Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck and running around in conservative circles and trying to be a radio host and you know trying to film stuff and figure myself out as a YouTuber and I came out as like this gay Republican before bisexual was like really a thing in my bubble. And mm. cuz bisexual in my bubble growing up just meant you were girls who made out with each other for men. Like it yeah. didn't it wasn't real in the same way that it is now. And it actually as I get older honestly <laughs> My partner pointed this out. He's like, bro, I think you're pansexual. I was like, holy fuck, am I pansexual? Do I not really care? And then I was like, no, no, I care about gender. And he's like, do you? And I was like, I think I do. Wait, what, maybe I don't. What do you think What do you think pan means? That's a, a big um, debate that there keeps having online of what it exactly. Do you think pan means like you just don't really have a preference? But For gender, yeah. Like, you could have like preferences. One or yeah. two maybe. Like usually from – because I was in Seattle for five years. So Seattle lingo would say bisexual is your gender or other gender, like one or two gender maybe. Um, and then mm. pansexual is like doesn't matter. The consciousness is all I care about. And as I've aged, the consciousness is all I care about. That's that's kind of what I felt like it was. But then I've seen bi people online being like, no, that's not what it means. Bi people can be attracted to whatever. And it's like – but I think that kind of circles back to what you were saying, that these are just constructs that we right. create. And especially with, like, queer lingo, I feel like mm. it's something where this is all very new. And a lot of times things that we talk about in the queer community are just kind of something someone came up with. Totally. Someone on Tumblr, you know, just kind of came up with. And these labels just – uh, I feel like, yeah, I, I don't understand these these arguments that people get into where they're super gatekeepy around like the exact meaning of these mm. labels. Because of course there are times where we need to like nail down set definitions, but who cares if like you have one definition of what it means to be pan and another person has another definition of what it means to be pan. Like, do we really need to come at each other's throats as two people in the same community of like, yeah. let's let's like beat each other up over our definition of the word pansexual. It just feels kind of silly to me. You know, that's so interesting though. That's so different because I, I 100% agree. I feel like, look, just tell me what it means to you so I can treat you accordingly. is kind of my thing. But I also know that mm. because I've met how many Christians do I have to meet to realize they're not all the same. Yeah. Everyone defines it differently. So just tell me how you define it so I can respect you within the boundaries of this reality, because right now we're not going to define the same, things the same way. So why, why does that? Cause that is kind of an, the stereotype of the left is that they aren't – they are militant. And I don't like that, but I think that's an online stereotype if I'm being real. So f why mm. do you think that you stand out or differ in that way? Like there must be a real re – like a reason, yes, meeting people where they're at. But I mean what is your – like where does that really come from when I'm talking to the consciousness that is Ryan? Um, Where does it really come from? Uh, I don't – I don't know. I think I just, I, I think it comes from a place of harm reduction, I guess, mm. where I'm thinking that why are we, I don't know. It just feels like a waste of our time and like our negative energy to get so wrapped up in being extremely militant over things where like, I feel like the times where these definitions are really things we need to nail down is when there's like a real, harm happening mm. you know and i don't think there's a real harm happening in us having a disagreement about the label of pansexual you know yeah if if i feel like there's harm around if someone's like um saying like trans people aren't real like that's something where you kind of have to really nail down like what the definitions of these things are because if we don't have some sort of definition then they're going to take their definition and they're going to run with it to pass legislature which yes. makes it more difficult for trans people to live their lives yes but no one is going to pass some sort of law <laughs> around like a disagreement on what pansexual means so i yeah. feel like that's something where that would be something more where i'm like just kind of live and let live you know like we don't have to get offended and upset about every single thing 
like kind of just more pick your battles, you know? That feels so efficient to my brain. And I really appreciate that because I do find myself, I left politics a long time ago and I realized I was like, hey, we're not, I just want to know what we're doing. Like, what is the point? What are we aiming for? And I'm a big believer of, I think politics should be more neutral. It shouldn't be about trans or cis people. It should be about how to protect American citizens if you live in America. It should be about how to protect people irregardless of gender. It should be about how to protect people regardless. It doesn't matter to me what your background is. I want to know if we're protecting our citizens and getting them the things they need to be better citizens. And so for me, I'm not convinced that politics isn't I'm just convinced it's a little too polarized to not make it about whatever side is going to win, especially with this election coming up. My anxiety is like through the roof. I don't know what's going to happen, but everyone needs to calm down. <laughs> everyone needs to get along. Yeah, I it, it, it's always a constant tension in my head because um, sometimes I feel like you do it like I've said this multiple times. Sometimes you do have to like take a stand. And sometimes I feel like you need to meet people with empathy. And it's kind of yeah. like a case by case basis um, because and, and I do think arguments around these um, like I feel like I got through to my dad when we were having a conversation about um, like gay marriage mm. where I came at it from like more of the freedom angle and less of the. Because I'm never going to convince him that right. like, oh, it's totally normal to be gay because he believes that in the Bible it says it's not. Right. And if your entire worldview is built around the Bible, I'm not going to like make you budge on that point. Yeah. But if you can meet them where they're at, where they have this idea of like freedom and like limited government and like you should stay out of people's lives unless you like really need to intervene. Um, like, why is it your place to say that the government should decide whether someone can or can't get married, even if someone has a different worldview than you? Mm. Um, like, I feel like most people would agree that I, obviously the Christian nationalists wouldn't, they would say like, we need everything to be Christian at all times. <laughs> so but exhausting. most people, yeah, but most people understand like we live in a society with different worldviews. Mm -hmm. We kind of have to coexist a little bit. We have to have the Christians living with the Muslims, living with yes. the atheists. Yes. Um, Hopefully. Yeah. I and mean, so, well, if you want diversity, I guess. Yeah. But they, the Christian nationalists would say yeah. they don't want diversity. Yeah, of course. But I think diverse, I think diversity is a good thing. I don't know. Mm. I feel like I, I, I think a society where we force out everyone who's not like us, I don't even think that would fix anything because mm. there would just be new new fractures within the community if we forced out everyone who isn't christian then probably the catholics and the protestants would then be at each other's oh, throats you know, again people will, <laughs> yeah <laughs> people will always find something to like come at each other for you know wait okay so i agree with this but then i have to ask you because i okay so i decided to leave all of my communities and to say to them i love you all i'm going to visit you i'm going to stop being a full-fledged participant and identifying with this community because I think that the way that I want to move solutions forward isn't cohesive with like a everyone agrees with this. Like you said in one of your videos recently, it was really good that um, you were trying to explain, I think, gender and you're trying to say that not every like conservative or Republican is the same. Somebody might believe like they're pro-gun or anti-gun or maybe pro-choice but still identify one way or another. You know, you meet the libertarians mm -hmm. and the moderates and then the centrists and then everyone's like, oh, I'm center left but not center right. And I'm like, don't call me this and don't – so everyone's a different yeah. version of whatever you're going to see. And everyone knows that progressives, we're all so different. Like I always say I'm progressive in my heart, but politically, sometimes I think it's annoying. But in my heart, I want a progressive world that is like gender inclusive and gender is like less of an issue and economic background is not going to be the reason you don't succeed in exactly the same way as it does now. So, I mean, I have mm. this dream of it being great, but I also know that people are so stubborn. And at this point in history, I feel like I'm just a part of it. So this is a blip in history. So I can only do what I can do. So do you kind of agree that we're in a blip of history, that I believe we're evolved animals on a planet? Do you have any idea of what you believe like humans are, why we're here, or how we got here? Yeah, I think we're evolved animals as well. I okay. agree with that, yeah. Yeah, so I um, that means that that forms though how I see the world now where I'm like, yeah, bros, like humans are going to human. Let's not, I don't like this, but like I'm not going to condemn you, but I want you to maybe be better than this. But if we're just animals yeah. on a planet, it's hard to ask people that. Yeah, I think I, I was having, I feel like you covered a few different things. Sorry, I know um, I'm sorry, I ranting. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Um, but yeah, the, the, going back to the thing about um, that people with different political beliefs are going to have different definitions of even what it means to be a conservative. Yeah. And yeah, people are going to have... Um, 
different definitions of what it means to be non-binary, for example, or whatever the label is. Um, and I do think that is the pitfall of kind of grouping people into communities sometimes mm. is that we can say like the trans community believes this and it's like well no not really like no yeah. no one is a monolith within any community like it's a e even when you group yourselves into communities there's still going to be diverse groups of thought within those communities yeah. so yeah i mean i i i kind of feel the same way that i i guess i am a part of the trans community because i'm non-binary but I, I, I don't know. I, I have always felt like, um, yeah, that a group doesn't necessarily have to agree on every single thing or that, um, or like, yeah, these are very big questions that it's, it's definitely, definitely <laughs> difficult to wrestle with. I will tell you. So my work is predicated on, I'm a big philosophy nerd, but only in well, only in the way that I think that I am. Not I don't know what that means to other people. They always tell me like, oh, that means you're into this and this and this. I'm like, no, no, I don't know what that means. I just like to read books and figure out what we're doing here on the planet and what should lead people to their joy. And so in one of your videos recently, you were talking about reality. You kept using the word reality. Like, this is not reality. This is not like, you, I think you were talking about Sneeko in particular. And I was, I think you were talking about like, he is not engaging with reality. But I think we are all engaging with our belief of what reality is and so how do you clarify what is real reality and like believed reality i think real reality would be things that you can um prove through empiricism is what i would say mm -hmm. things that you can um scientifically like back up with evidence mm -hmm. but then there's the whole thing of like science is always constantly evolving as well yes it is um but i do think that there are things that are true and things that are not true that you can kind of prove based on um you know being able to kind of re repeatedly show it to be true mm -hmm. um like i'm not gonna yeah I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea of like my truth where you can just say like this is my truth and therefore it's true it's like yeah. i feel like we have to in order to function in a society we have to base things off of some level of can we prove this through data of some sort yeah um, because eventually you are going to come up against times where people have hard disagreements and then you have to make you still have to like pass laws about like this is what we are going to say is acceptable and this is what yeah. we're going to say is not acceptable so at that point we can't just go off of my truth anymore we have to go off of like what does the data show mm. what is like kind of empirically showing is bringing harm to people rather than just what people feel like, you know, mm. so that I would say I'm, um, yeah, I want everyone to be able to have their own perspectives. Um, but then I feel like on a societal level, we have to kind of base things off of what you can em empirically, uh, demonstrate. Is what this, I is, say. this is what I've been super struggling with lately because I'm a person who really tried to go through the systems. I tried to figure out like which bubble works for me, which system is going to work for me. How am I going to be helped? And as a person who's like struggled with mental health, you know, I'm I got diagnosed with borderline. I'm diagnosed with PTSD. I'm recently diagnosed with fib fibromyalgia. And so I'm like, great. Oh, wow. Love it. It's okay. at least it's that and not awesome. autoimmune. They thought it was autoimmune and it's not. Thank God. Like, that's really hard. What's like, the difference I, between the two of those? Um, well, at least my immune system's not trying to murder me, but they thought it was autoimmune for so long. Basically, I'm in chronic pain all the time and my bones feel like they're oh. shattering. My nerves are just like working at 120 billion percent. So if I feel mm. pain, it's like, that's a lot of pain, my bros. So no big deal. I mean, it is a big deal. I emotionally like was distraught by it for the last year. Yeah. But now that I have a diagnosis and I can move forward with it, I'm experiencing like a different new reality where I'm like, oh, I am no longer in the bubble of healthy. I am now in the bubble of chronically mm. ill. And I'm like, how does that feel? Ill, yeah. Like I'm in pain. I can't – the things I wanted to do before, I can't do now. If pearly things mm. wanted to box me in a boxing match, I'm not going to do that. I will feel so hurt yeah. if that happens. So I think about yeah. how I have this new identity that I have to have a relationship with. And this is personal and this is my relationship with my illness, right? But that means I'm forming like a reality that's my own. And the statistics, mm -hmm. the medicine, the way they talk about fib fibromyalgia, which is not a lot of information, P.S., they're going to come up with data that's not going to always reflect the nuances of my personal experience. So how mm -hmm. do you make peace with that, that these generalizations will leave people out? 
It's it. Yeah, it is tough because um, like what medications are good to prescribe to people is all kind of just based on generalizations. Mm -hmm. um, and there could be someone potentially who a medication could be good for, but they're not going to get prescribed it because in general, it's not good for people with their condition. So <laughs> that is something that... <laughs> This is uh, Brittany from the future past, whatever. Uh, so at this point in the podcast, my OBS decided not to record. And I lost an hour of us recording together in the most, it was the most fantastic conversation. So Ryan was so nice and just picked up where we could and we did what we did. And this is the result of us trying to figure out what do we do now? We lost an hour of footage. What, you know, what what's the solution? And the next hour you're about to watch or whatever it is, was our solution. Enjoy for right now. Okay, so we were talking about my chronic illness. I think what we can do, it feels like dis I can't handle the disingenuousness of like repeating the conversation. It gives yeah. me like anxiety to pre like to pretend that we didn't just lose all that data. And then, oh, like, Ryan, what did you think about this? As if I, you didn't just tell me the answer. So then it feels mm -hmm. like disingenuous to pretend like we didn't just lose all that footage. So I wonder if we could do instead, if I could even, I'm recording right now, maybe I could even leave this in and we can talk about what do you do when life doesn't go the way you think it's going to go? Yeah, that that's what I was thinking. Like, just, um, just explain that it cut off and then... And we then can this just is it. Move the conversation in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you think about like this very real moment that just happened? Here I was, so fucking ready for this conversation. You're so wonderful. The answers were so good. And then the recording wasn't even recording the last hour and a half. Yeah. Or hour. I can't That's, believe it. Uh, <laughs> that is unfortunately just how life goes sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's just part of sometimes things are out of our control and <laughs> dumb shit happens, unfortunately. What do you do? What should I, what advice can you give me right now? Comfort me, right? What should I do? How should I feel about this? I think, um, well, like I, I mentioned to you before we were recording, I think this a similar thing happened to me when I was um, talking to Curtis Connor. And it was like, this was like something I had thought about for years because he's like such a big commentary creator and I look up to him so much. And then it's like, oh, shit, most of our collab, I wasn't recording the whole time. And it's just... Um, I think it's just something that feels really bad in the moment. And then yeah. a few months down the road, you won't, uh, you won't even remember that it happened. So I'm just so embarrassed that I like had you come on my podcast and then I was like, I wasn't even, rec I don't know what happened. Yeah. I it's know it's totally okay. Fine. Like, I know it's okay. Like, of course it's okay. But now yeah. I'm so frazzled that I'm like, I don't, how do you even continue? I mean, honestly, the, con here's what happened. So the last hour of our conversation has basically been you being able to humanize so many bubbles and still hold an opinion in which you can be critical of bubbles. And that's what I want to do. My personal opinion, I'm very critical of a lot of people. But my public persona, I'm trying to really bring out the best version of myself. And that version is trying to really meet people where they're at even more patiently than my real self that just wants to go to sleep because I'm chronically ill and I'm tired. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? So I guess we can pick up the conversation with when life isn't perfect. <laughs> And you're faced with someone or something that is anxiety inducing, stress inducing, frustrating. What do you do? Do you ignore it and pretend it never happened? Or do you face it, dissect it and put it where it belongs? Yeah, I think you um, I, like you were saying, I think if you just ignore that something bad happened, uh, it's just going to make it feel not genuine if we were to yeah. try to go back and and rehash what we were talking about. But um, this, this is an interesting um, thing that we hadn't necessarily touched on the idea of people talk about like if you bring um like a a person with like a negative perspective uh, and you try to like have a conversation with them and humanize them they talk about like oh you're like platforming a bad person mm. and you're giving them like an opportunity to spread kind of their negative perspective mm -hmm. when they wouldn't have necessarily had that platform before I'm curious what your thoughts are on kind of like that, that, um, cause I think you, you yeah. have a perspective of have a conversation with anyone, right? Yeah. Anyone that I can tolerate and speak to and understand. I've tried in the past yeah. to speak to other people and I just, man, I couldn't really get them. I was like, I don't get what's happening here. I feel like I'm being gaslit or confusing, or I feel like, I feel like you're being genuine, but also malicious. So I, I would, that's so funny. Cause before it, I looked to see how we were doing on our recording. I was going to ask you your advice about meeting mm. with people that are controversial because I was thinking about what if I had the opportunity 
to meet some very controversial people. Should I meet them? And a part of me, so Brittany, the person, yes, I want to meet them because I'm like, how do you think like this? What is your brain doing? Like, why are you coming to these conclusions? Brittany, the content Mm -hmm. creator, feels slightly responsible, slightly, to make sure that people know that I don't condone this behavior, but I want to humanize even the worst of people to the best of my ability and then hold them accountable to the best of my ability. So I don't want people to think I'm condoning behavior just because I hang out with people. I want people Mm -hmm. to know that I want to see if they can be someone different. And if they're not going to be, then live and let live. And I don't need to be around that all the time. So I I, I struggle with that immensely. Like, I really am thinking, like, what if I do have the opportunity to, like, meet Andrew Tate? Or, or like, if you have a conversation with someone who's controversial, then it feels like there's this extra pressure from your audience mm-hmm. where they're like, okay, if you're going to talk to someone controversial, you better have a good debate performance or you better, like, be able to hit them and nail them on the contradictions. And if you don't, then you it's like, yeah, it feels like talking to someone who's controversial is much more of like a high pressure thing. Yeah. Um, I, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, there was one time where I made a commentary video about this guy named big Nick. I don't know if you've, yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. like a blog squad guy. Um, <laughs> the weirdest, that was the weirdest anime twist in the world. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing with your life, my bro. He went in the weirdest directions. Yeah, he went like super anti-vax, super. Um, I think he just found community in a very, very um, kind of conservative bubble yeah. after. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, honestly, he was kind of really treated like shit by a yeah. lot of the. Um, it kind of makes sense how yeah. he, online spaces or like David Dobrik and his crew or I think they're all kind of like liberal type mm-hmm. people and yeah. they all they still like took advantage of him and they yeah. treated they treated him like he was like a puppet or like a you know he's just the you know yeah. short guy and all of our jokes are going to be around like how short you are so it's like it kind of makes sense that he like he went out to this Hollywood environment where people are supposed to be like really accepting and like we're all liberal and we're all like you know um, and then they just sort of treat him like he's not an actually a human being. Yeah. And then that makes him be like, oh, shit, I was treated really terribly here. Now I'm going to, you know, come to religion where it feels like there's this message of like God is saying that he loves me mm-hmm. um, and maybe God will give me the love that I wasn't able to find in this like liberal community where everyone was yeah. dehumanizing me and treating me like shit, you know, so it kind of makes sense how he we went on that journey. Absolutely. I actually, okay, you know how I talk, well, I don't even know if it was recorded, but in our conversation before, I talked about how my parents talked this really big game, like, we're going to kick you out of the house if you're gay. But then when their kids came out, they're like, like, they were almost annoyed that they had to deal with it. And it hurts them to some extent, because they think, you know, we might be going to hell, but they don't really think that I know they know we're good people. But in particular, I think I'm trying to be like them weirdly enough with other people because I know for a fact them not actually rejecting me kept me from unaliving myself like every time I wanted to or I attempted to I always thought but what if my parents actually do love me and I'm misunderstanding them and they do I wish I I, over the years especially after therapy I kind of taught them to love me better easy uh, more for me like more about me than about how they needed Mm. to love me and then I've learned to love them how they need to be loved versus how I wanted to love them so that fantasy Mm. of my parents disappeared but I will say that I think people like Big Nick people like Sneeko end up in communities where they're embraced after being rejected and ostracized the reason Sneeko talks to me is because I'm like yeah I get it like I've been similar places but not this but like on this side and like oh yeah I get where you got here but like what about if this is real what if this is real it's like I can be patient with him because I get it and I think he's genuine I just think he's I I think it's really hard not to have values when you have really strong opinions and a lot of people got strong opinions with no values do you feel me so Mm. I think there is solace in those communities I think that's the mistake a lot of people make but you know how you hear that in bubbles they'll be like um well you should have embraced them and like the left made the left made Andrew Tate the left made Andrew Tate it's like yeah in the same way that conservatives made BLM riots Or white nationalists made BLM riots. Like we all make each other. We are reacting instead of being being thoughtful and considerate before action. We're just all reacting. So I find that Mm -hmm. to be the hardest issue that we're facing, honestly, is that desire to not just send that tweet when you know you should wait a second. How how do you think? um, How do you think the left could have um, not like made Andrew Tate? If if that's like the perspective that you have. No, no, no. It's not the perspective. I well. 
I believe that the tenets of it is real for certain people, but I don't think like straight people make gay people or trans people make trans people. I just think people are looking for community. They want to be seen, seen, they want to see and be seen. They want to be loved and be loved. They want to be understood. They want to be humanized. And they're going to go to whatever mm-hmm. community does those things, whether it's bad or good in the long run, whether it actually fulfills their joy. Like I always say, and I do specify, I think Andrew Tate is really happy. I don't think he's joyful. Mm-hmm. I think happiness yeah. is like an emotion that comes and goes. It's a dopamine hit. It's a, I'm happy. And then I'm not happy. Oh, and then I'll do this thing. I'm happy again. But to be joyful means even if the world is destroyed around you, you still find the sense of hope and peace and joy in it. I think I get this from my parents, immigrants who came from war torn Iraq, who even when they lost everything, people were murdered in front of them. They they had their faith and that's their joy, but they really came to something that allowed them to still be good people. They never became the monsters that tortured them. And I think that that's so important, but my parents have hope. They have a real sense of hope in Jesus Christ. And I have a real yeah. sense of hope in my humanity. Yeah. And listening to Andrew Tate, he he kind of has a, if you really listen to what he's saying, he kind of has a very nihilistic view on things. He's kind of like, well, society is corrupt, and and um, so I'm just going to run with the corruption and be as corrupt as I can be because everyone else around me is corrupt. So exactly. So why not just be corrupt too? And it's like, no, you, we have to rise above that, you know? Yes. Okay, this is what I tried to explain to people who don't get, like, the Sneeko bubble. I'm like, okay, so Sneeko's a young man who's seen all of these people. Let's say he sees a progressive on the internet, and the progressive on the internet who's trying to tell him he's bad is also somebody who doesn't treat the people around him in the best way why would Sneeko Mm -hmm. switch bubbles when that bubble gives him less of what he needs than this bubble so Tate's bubble gave him money community fame structure like all these things that he's like oh man wait maybe there's something here and then on top of that he's watching Trump he's watching our politicians he's watching the corruption and he's going well if they're doing it and they get to be president What's wrong with it if people want to vote for this, if people believe in this? But people don't actually think they're voting for Trump because he's corrupt. They think they're voting for a guy who rises above the corruption. Yeah. It, you they know, so they, he's like the he's the truth speaker. Yeah. And I'm like, really? He's not really. No, yeah. he's a part of the game. He's playing a different. He's playing the businessman game. He's not playing the politician game. He's playing the businessman game. But it is still a game to get the most dollar no matter the consequences. Mm-hmm. And I am a person and I, well, told I think I think he's just playing the politician game in a different way. I think oh, interesting. Um, I think well, I think leading up to the 2016 election, I think uh, especially in Washington, there was a lot of like respectability politics. Yeah, there was kind of the idea of the most respectable, well put together person is the person that we should listen to. And I think a lot of America got kind of fed up with the respectability politics mm. angle. So then Trump kind of kicked down the door and said, like, no, I'm going to make fun of everyone. And, you know, it's yeah, I mean, everything is kind of an action and a reaction. I think um, if I had to say why I think Andrew Tate kind of arose, I think it's like society just moves in in different waves. I think that like there was a lot of um, oppression against women. And then I think a lot of women um, definitely reacted to that in an understandable way where they're like this is absolutely unacceptable um but then that kind of turns into animosity against men and them saying like i hate men kill all men men Mm. suck um and a lot of times when women say they hate men they don't really mean they hate men they just mean that they hate the men that have been mistreating them um but then young men on the internet see women saying that they hate men and they don't understand the context of the societal the you know, the history of oppression that women went through that led them up to that point where then they say that they hate men because of the way men have treated them. All they see is women saying that they hate men. And then Andrew Tate can come in and capitalize and say, see, these women hate you. I love you. Come to my side. We'll make a bunch of money together. And then he he can also put in all these pepper and all these ideas of like, we were so much happier back in that time where women had less rights. Let's all go back to, and then, you know, (laughs) the cycle just keeps going. Yeah. That's, sort of how it works, you know? So do you think Andrew Tate, because I think Myron really believes what he's saying. Like, I think he's had some really painful experiences with women because the way he talks reminds me of how I felt a little bit where I was like on guard and it's dangerous, but I never got to the point of objectifying men quite the way that he objectifies women. Like I really stopped myself. I feel like Tate could either be a grifter, like a businessman who's just like giving a product out 
or he could be a conservative-ish guy who thinks this way but is amplifying like a character or is just authentic. Like I, he could be anything at this point. I don't know. Like I don't know what my I, – that's why I kind of want to meet him because I'm like I want to look at him in the eye and be like, what are you doing? You're a grown-up. Yeah. What are you doing? And then I just want to get Tate this, is, you know. Yeah, I feel like Andrew Tate is more kind of a tough nut to crack because – like, I think his lawyers have even made the defense of like, oh, yeah, it's clearly a character. And uh, but then what does know, that mean for the he, men that just... he grifted? Yeah, because to them, it's not a character to people like Sneeko. I think Sneeko is 100 percent genuine. He's really bought mm -hmm. into the ideas that Andrew Tate is pushing to them. And I think that's kind of the danger of it is in Andrew Tate's world. I think a lot of it, my view of what he's doing is that it's kind of a means to an end. It's like, mm. if I can get all these young men on my side, then they're going to sign up for my hustlers university course. And um, it kind of feels like, yeah, it's a business game. It's, it's yeah. less about pushing truth and more about how can I get as many men to sort of uh, adopt the idea that I'm promoting. Yeah. Um, and then you have people like Sneeko. I mean, Sneeko is uh, selling his own course. As yeah. Well, but I've had some viewers who bought know. it. Mm hmm. What, what did they say about it? Did you know, they said it was actually okay and pretty good. It was mostly copywriting stuff and how to run a business. And can I be real? I got invited to a women's business group. It was really fun and fantastic. I got sponsored for it, though, because it's very expensive. These people hang out with billionaires. And I'm going to be real. I don't think it was worth the price because you're just teaching me stuff that that $50 Sneeko kit could have taught me. But they're charging thousands thousands so like no offense yeah. in the business world of business people are always selling you information you can get on youtube they're just packaging it in a way that you want to buy it from them so i can't even yeah. fault sneeko for doing that when i see it happen in even feminist groups i'm like oh shit we're playing the business game cool well there's there's um there's an element of truth to what sneeko says about how like colleges do like charge people too much money there are people who are like stuck in debt for their entire lives because yep. of going to college. I don't agree with his conclusion of like, just because there are some bad things about college, right. completely throw out college and right. only get your education off of YouTube. But it's, it's yeah, it's kind of like what you're saying. There are seeds of truth along the way. Yes. And we have to acknowledge those seeds of truth. Like, yeah, we kind of really do need to fix the college system so it's more like accessible for people and so people aren't stuck with crippling debt over these things. Um, I can't believe America doesn't want to invest in their population's education. That's all I'm seeing it as. Again, do we yeah. want America to be the smartest? Do we want us to contend with the world? We have to invest in education. And they're like, no. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure the statistics back up that investing oh. in the education leads to people making more money for the population in the long term. So even yeah. from like, in economic perspective, you'd think that that's like worth doing. But that's um, what I'm telling the conservatives. I was like, y'all got to understand that if you want people to be good Americans, we have to keep them healthy and educated. It's yeah. like, but the the agenda, the ideology, the things that my parents are still convinced to this day that public school, two years of public school is the reason why I'm bisexual. And I'm like, bros, yeah. the liberal media got into me, the liberal ideology. A lot of that is just from like we talked about, I think th this was on video. Like we were raised in like homeschool bubbles. Yeah. And I guess you, you could look at the trajectory I went on and say, Oh, it's proof that that actually does exist. I think it's more just like, once you leave your bubble, you meet other people and you yeah. realize that there's a much bigger world out there. And there's a lot more possibilities for routes that I could take that would overall lead to me feeling more happy and fulfilled. It's not like, I mean, there definitely are, um, a lot of progressive ideas being taught in college, but I mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that's like a terrible thing. Right, um, right. I don't think it's like, I, I had this like desire to go back to college and I was like, I want to get a history degree so I can know about like the human history so I can talk about bubbles and talk about my philosophy system and do And then I was like, wait, who's teaching me this history? Wait, which mm -hmm. history am I learning? And then I start to get anxiety about like, I can't trust anything because I'm like, well, who's going to teach it to me? Who's going to tell me this is what happened? My mom can't even get straight what happened 30 years ago in our family history. How are we going to know what happened a thousand years ago? And so I started to have this anxiety of like, is there no place I can go get like objective history? Like, is, is does that bubble exist? Is there an objective history bubble? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I feel like you have both sides. You have um, conservatives being like, oh, you can't trust history classes because they're teaching you like critical race theory. And then you yeah. have leftists talking about like how all history is, it has like a white supremacist like um, uh, lean to it. And yeah. Things are, are, are framed in the way of like not 
realizing the exploitation that's happened to different groups and things. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if there is a way to necessarily get um, objective history. I, I definitely don't think I was taught objective history growing up. No in way. A, uh, <laughs> in a conservative <laughs> thing where, um, uh, yeah, I think in my history book, it literally said like socialism is the most evil ideology <laughs> that exists. <laughs> So beautiful. Okay, can I tell you my relationship with systems is so awkward because I always say like, yeah, I don't care. Like, I don't even believe in systems failing. I just think people fail. So like, what system am I in? Tell me how to succeed. Am I a socialist? Cool. Communist? Cool. Capitalist? Cool. I just feel like it doesn't matter. What matters is like, does this work for the people? Is it efficient? What are our goals? And again, because we can't agree on goals, none of us, it's like we can't get there. And in my head, I'm just like, I want you guys to be happy and educated and able to afford living. Like, we have enough resources. We have enough where are all these fresh and fit men who have made the world so wonderful? Where's the efficiency with healthcare then? Where's the efficiency yeah. with education then? If men built an amazing world, why are we failing behind other countries if we're so great? Where is the proof in the pudding? I want to see America succeed through those means. Like, cause as I'm going to Europe, my partner sat me down during one of our first dates and he goes, okay, I feel like you have American understanding of the world so i'm going to test you and i was like okay and he's like okay ready in europe we have no common knowledge i was like great he goes what is it wait what did he ask me he asked oh it's like random questions you would ask like a fifth grader bro like how many continents are there and i'm like i never had to know that he goes what do you mean i was like i never had to know this he goes how do you make so much money and you don't know anything and i was like because you don't need to be smart to make money <laughs> Like, you don't need to know things yeah. to make money. I'm sorry. So I told him, I was like, well, I was homeschooled. And in high school, I think they would have expected me to know that. So I never needed to know it. And then now I'm like learning. I'm like, oh, okay, there's like continents and these, like he lives in a country that I never even processed existed. I'm moving to this place that's homogenous. I'm moving to this place that has like a shared language and a shared culture. And I'm moving to a part of the country that does not speak English. So it's going to be interesting being there. But I know that there is like a reason they're cohesive. And I don't even think it's because they all believe the same. I think it's all they have the same expectation of each other even if they don't believe the same does that make sense like mm -hmm. they have um an expectation of behavior a standard so he was trying to explain to me you're moving to a place that has a standard mm -hmm. versus in america when he came to visit me he's like what's the standard in this city not even in this state what is the standard in this city because america is so diverse and we're so uh, chaotic and different that i'm not sure um you can give a straight answer to somebody who's visiting. Like if somebody said, oh, how do I act in this country where he is? I could give them an answer. But if they come mm -hmm. here, it's like, um, where were you going? Yeah. And which part are you going to? Yeah. And like, which part yeah. are you in California? Are you in like San Diego where they're Republicans? Or are you in San Francisco where they're Democrats? Mm -hmm. And that's the same place. I think um, like what you were saying before about like why we can't even figure out how to get health care. I think... Mm -hmm. I think it's just because America has been so focused on what makes the most money. And I think yeah. being focused on what makes the most money has led to us having a lot of like technological achievements and a lot mm. of like, um, you know, really, uh, you know, we're like the forefront in the world and like technology and those sorts of things. But then what makes the most money isn't necessarily what's always going to be best for the most people. And I feel yeah. like the, the, the most money making healthcare system is not going to be the healthcare system that is prioritizing people's needs the most. So I feel like that's kind of the push and pull that's happening there. But yeah, I moved to Australia and um, it's been pretty crazy how much easier it is to get healthcare here and how much more affordable it is. Yeah. Oh, I spent 16K of my own money last year on my healthcare bills. And I sat there and I was like, and I calculated it all out. I did the math. I chose the most efficient route for the cheapest price. Like I really did do the research. But like with since May of last year, I've spent 16K on my health and I'm like, cool. Or at least last year I did. And I was like, okay, okay, fine. I can accept this. Like I can accept that I had to make an investment because I think we live in the wild, wild west, but with iPhones. So I'm like, okay, so this is the rule of this game I'm playing. But now I'm moving to a country where once we're married and the legal paperwork is done, I'm going to have health care for way cheaper. My dentist wanted $3,000 for my teeth, but I'm just going to go over there and do it for like way cheaper. And I'm sitting here thinking like, I, I will support these infrastructure. I will support easier living on people so they can make families and make taxpayer babies. Like I will pump out 10 babies for you to pay taxes if you would just make my rent a little cheaper. <laughs> like I will work with you. But I don't think America right now is focused on working with the people. And that's kind of a disappointment. Um, not that I'm big into our politics, but I think that we need to consider 
I think overall, do we want Americans to be free and healthy? And I hope the answer mm-hmm. is yes. But again, how we get that to happen is just so divided. Even my own birth control, tell me this, tell me this. Recently, Papa Gut was covering Sneeko and he was like shook that Sneeko was believing this idea that women's birth control is going into the water systems from our urine. Have you heard this theory? I haven't heard this, no. Okay, this is something I'm so used to in my bubble. Like I've heard this for years. My parents are, I'm, I'm on birth control now. My mom and dad are like, don't you know you're peeing into the toilet and you're like putting birth control in our water? And I was like, Ugh. this is like a very funny conservative conspiracy theory or theory. I don't, you know. And Sneeko heard it for the last first time recently and he was like, oh my God. And I was like, no, no, no stop. It, it just sounds good, but it's not reasonable. Like it just sounds good. And maybe if, even if I was an environmentalist and a vegan and I would say something like, yeah, don't put anything in our soil that isn't pure and chemicals are bad and birth control is chemical. But literally they run with it. Like women are the reason because they have birth control that the water's polluted. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh my, yeah. It's like the leaps well, and it's bounds. Also, it's also like urine. <laughs> like obviously they're going to filter it to the point where it's not urine anymore before we're like drinking it back. It's like I don't know and where to like- – but- yeah, well, like, where's the th- where's the understanding? It's fine. I, like, I understand why it sounds good. You ever hear that? Like, something will sound good. Like, yeah, I think that makes sense. And then if you think about it longer, you're like, actually, I think that just yeah. sounded good. That's a really hard thing. I think humans like things that sound good. I think they really like the natural versus chemical. Like, chemical feels dangerous. It feels yeah, bad. Yeah. Natural feels good. But there are like poisons that are totally natural, like I think like arsenic or something you can find in nature. Mm. And then there are chemicals like that we use in medicine all the time and are totally safe. Like, yeah, the whole natural versus chemical. I'll go a step further. I think everything that humans are is nature. And so everything we built is natural. Like, I'll go a step further. That's kind of my belief. It's a little silly, but it is kind of like, look, we're nature. We made it nature like it's all like this came from us but i don't think nature is indifferent i think nature is violent and amazing and destructive like the ocean is so scary and that's nature a storm is scary and that's nature when did nature become nice like sometimes it is but when did it become universally a good thing you know what i mean it's just a a strange narrative It's natural to to go yeah it's natural to uh, burn yourself alive in a fire but that's not really (laughs) <laughs> I don't think you should do that. Like that's, that's okay. not not going to be healthy for you. <laughs> it's not going to be no, ten out of ten. Do not recommend. So okay, here's it's the, natural to give yourself skin cancer by sitting oh, outside. The sun is such a natural thing, and yet I have an allergy to the sun, and like it burns and scabs my skin. And then a part of me is like, the sun is literally killing me. But then so is the cancer in our food. Like I'm going to a country where my favorite snack is banned, hot Cheetos, because of the cancer mm. in the red the red forty. You know, there's cancer property. Yeah. yeah, red food diet. And so I'm just like sitting there, like oh my god america is so fun like i love us like we are free there's something really beautiful about that i'm free enough that i'm allowed to get cancer i guess but then also <laughs> i feel like these food companies it's like they know they're gonna get a little oh. bit more profit if they make it a little bit more colorful Bro. like they could use a different dye that wasn't quite so bright but they know their profit margin is going to go up just a little bit if they put a cancer thing in it it's also been interesting um, i think cereals here in australia um, like all of them have like less sugar in them. Like yeah. America just like pumps sugar into fucking everything because yeah, a little bit more sugar makes it a little bit more addictive. And then, yep. you know, of course that leads to the obesity epidemic that we're yeah. having. And, yeah. This new diet I've been on because of, they thought it was autoimmune. So they put me on this really strict diet, like very low carbs, high fats, like very focused on like giving my body like enough energy through fats, but like not focusing on the inflammation, which is carbs, blah, blah, blah. And I've been doing this diet and I do see a slight improvement for sure. It's there, but man, I miss donuts and I can't wait to get back on gluten and I can't wait to eat things, but I'm going to be more yeah. like conscientious about what I am eating because again, now that I am partnered, I can't, it's not just my life anymore. Now it's, okay, I'm so sorry. What is our health rules in this relationship? How long do I have to live? Mm. And then it's like the longest we can. I'm like, oh, and uh, so I now. I have to live for a little while longer, yeah. Literally, because like I, you know, I've been skydiving. I like to do rest, reckless things, but now I'm, hes- I've been, I've done drugs and now I'm hesitant because I'm like, what if I do DMT again and I never come back? Like I have a partner now. I have somebody I take care of. He takes mm. care of me. Like to, I don't want to abandon him versus my family. They do fine if I like. You know, went in on a journey they've of my other, own. They've got other other children. <laughs> they've got other people. I'm one of ten. It's fine. What's one missing? But it is kind yeah. of a um an interesting like that dichotomy between happiness and joy. I think is going to be the struggle for the next long time. You know, do I want to be happy and have a Bugatti, 
Or do I want to be joyful and have something a little bit more modest but fulfilling? Like if Sneeko had taken my advice that I, you know, encourage people to take a long time ago, he would have been poor. Because my advice would have been turn down the money. It's not worth it. Turn yeah. down this like greed, turn down this thing. So that's why I liked the recent interview I did with him. He's like, money is not the goal. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about that. Because for the for a lot of people, money is the goal. And it, it was more the goal for him for a while. It was more the goal. It was more the goal. I think he's even trying to be more independent from Tate himself. Because I do think he's has a potential of being a better person than Tate. Tate's on his journey. He's really older. But I think Sneeko has an opportunity to do great things. I want to ask one last question, and then I think it's a good place to end it. How do you feel about that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk about spaces on the internet. And I want to talk about this thing that I feel like I'm facing, which is because I like to talk to everyone, a lot of people don't want to talk to me. I'm actually kind of surprised mm-hmm. you did this. I was a little worried you'd see that I talked to Sneeko, and then you wouldn't want to talk to me. And Yeah. I, that, you know. If I'm being honest, that that thought um, did cross my mind. But... I, I feel like in the conversations I've seen from you, it feels like you always, I don't know, it doesn't feel like you have malicious intentions whatsoever. It doesn't feel like you're just trying to grift and make as much money as possible or. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I really don't like Sneeko, mm. but I, I don't know. I, I don't think I would say that you're just a terrible person through association because you talk to him. Um, and I think that, I don't know, there is something about Sneeko that he just kind of feels a bit like a lost child a little bit. And mm. it, I, I start feeling a bit of empathy for the guy after seeing him get like constantly called a cuck for months on yeah. end. It's like, I really hate it's that. Like, of course. It's like, of course he's going to, and I've, I mean, I've done it as well, sure. um, but it's like, <laughs> But it's like, of course, he's going to keep going down this <laughs> rabbit hole if we keep uh, if we don't allow him any room to yeah. to grow out of. Th- that's another big question is um, like leftists always talk about rehabilitative justice. The idea of like, yeah. we don't want to be punitive. We don't want our justice to just be about like, let's punish people like that's that's what justice used to be about is like, let's right. just give them the worst punishment possible. Let's hang them in the town square and make everyone see. But I feel like leftists, we try to approach things with more like empathy. And we try to say like, just because someone did something bad, that doesn't mean they're irredeemable and let's work yeah. to rehabilitate them and like work. But then it feels like the way we act online and the way we act on Twitter feels kind of like the opposite of that sometimes <laughs> where we're like, yeah. 10 years ago, you said this, so we're never going to associate with you. You're out of our little leftist club. It's like leftism, it, like it shouldn't be a club. It should be about like, if we're really trying to create the best society for everyone, we want like everyone on our side. We want people to be able to like mature from the yeah. mistakes they've made in the past, you know? Absolutely. I so, st- well, Go ahead, please finish your thought. It, it, yeah, my my if if five years from now, Sneeko is like, you know what? I really went down a terrible rabbit hole and I was really um these ideas sounded really good to me, but now I've taken the time to reflect and see the error of my ways. I would still understand if some people didn't want to associate with him just sure. because they feel like he's done like enough shit that they're like, Hey, I just don't like you. But for sure. I don't know. I, I would be open to him rehabilitating himself with time personally. Yeah, I think there's it's so funny. The Sneeko fans are always, like some of them will be like, Brittany, I can tell you want him to change, but he doesn't need to. He's so mature. And I was like, dude, we all need to change my bros. Like people will be like, Brittany, you need to do better. And I'm like, I do. And they're like, what? And I was like, look, I'm lenient. I can I can be patient for 40 years. Everyone has a journey, right? Everyone has their own journey. But I think boundaries are so key to this space where even whether you're online or in your real life, it's like, hey, I'm open, but I have boundaries. I love you. I think we think differently. Like my mom and dad, I love them. I can only visit them like three to four days before we start fighting over politics yeah so even we have strong boundaries which is my mom always goes i love you betsy go home and i'm like bye (laughs) and that we got to that point versus i'm not exaggerating we would yell at the top of our lungs and i'm like environments matter my dad's like plastic can but what is it what is it bro when things break down biodegrade yeah my dad's like plastic can and i'm like listen and like we'll be yelling and now we're just like yeah, you know, I just feel like the oceans like need some help. And like we try to have different mm-hmm. conversations now, but that took years of wanting to, wanting to invest in those people. So that's why I don't want to ask the world to invest in Sneeko. I think Sneeko broke rules and got kicked off YouTube and that's what it is. Like that was his move. That was his decision. 
but the person that is Sneeko, the consciousness that is him, that that someone's son, someone's, you know, sibling, that person, I would like to be able to have a relationship with that person. In the same way that I I would love to have like a good relationship with you, with Ethan, with Chad Chad, with all these people on the internet that I think are so fun and so different. And even though we don't actually uh, like quite believe the same things, we believe enough of the same things to get along. I mean, God, if we can't get along, why am I asking the world to? So I struggle with this. And I know I think um, I come off very aggressive um, and I come off very um, judgy and I am gay judging the fuck out of everybody. But I just mm-hmm. genuinely want to understand too, like, can we get along, bros? Because like, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I loved, I am so sad an hour of this conversation disappeared because your brain is so great. And I want people to see like, oh, see, we can have conversations. And that's all I'm asking people to do. You know what I mean? And I, yeah, and I think I mentioned <laughs> this. I I don't know if this was before or after the time cut <laughs> off. I feel like, I, I feel like my brain does work in a way where I am trying to see all sides of things. I'm not just trying to be someone who, if you're my enemy, then I'm just going to assume that everything you're saying, like, I want to understand what got people to where they're at, because the only way to get people out of where they're at is to understand what brought them to where they're at. But then I just feel like the way I've been engaging with people on Twitter recently, like Twitter, just, Mm. it only really lets you like, just refute the one thing. It doesn't let you go into the whole like that's something I really love in my videos is being able to say like, Hey, here's where I agree with you. Here's the points where I am with you up until this point. And here's yeah. where it like went off in a different direction or here's where like, um, I can empathize with your struggle, but here's where I think that you're taking it in a harmful direction. But yeah. It's just like so difficult to do that on Twitter. And then people, it's just like, we get into tribes and and it's, in leftist spaces, there's like, it just feels like, oh, you have to choose if you're in this click or that click, and that yeah. click hates this click because they're all racist over here, or Ugh. these people are all like too woke or whatever. And it's like, I don't know, it's just exhausting. It is. I you know I think my dream life is like, um, we can all say those things, but then we come together like once a month to like discuss ideas. But not really. That's such a kid fantasy. But I have it. I have it in me. I have this like desire to be like, yo, why do you guys think this? Like, are, so you're like this and this. Like, what's up with that? Like, what led you? Because that's so interesting. Like, the human story is so interesting. Like, if we are these evolved creatures on a planet over time, then what we have done is kind of worth telling that story we should know the details of how different people ended up in different places but i just think that people aren't the truth is scary but like you, but tell like me, you tell said me. about bound but like you said about boundaries if we're yeah. like, hey, let's all get together hey nazi come in and explain to us why yeah. you want us all dead like yeah. i feel like they're do- <laughs> <laughs> there there has to be like a that's uh, the really uh, yeah. difficult thing is that figuring is. out where the cutoff is where yeah. where are we going to put up the boundary where are we going to say Hey, our, our empathy has kind of run out at this point. Like, please don't kill us. You know, it's, 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 you know what, can I be real with you? And I think maybe you have this experience with your parents. Maybe you don't, but I feel like I was born in a dysfunctional home that was mostly love, but also like not as bad as like some families. So I can't just cut off my parents. Like they're not that bad, but they're bad enough mm-hmm. that like people who are healthier were like, what are you doing? And I was like, Ch-ch-ch-ch. And then, like, the problem is, is, like, I don't have, like, I don't have Nazis in my circles. Like, you know when January 6th happened? Um, my homie calls me, and she goes, turn on the news, turn on the news. I turn it on, and I'm like, what in the fuck is this? What is this? And then I called my mom. I was like, you had better not be there. And she's like, girl, we do not. We have jobs. We are not leaving our house to go yeah. protest with Trump. Like, none of the people I knew are quite in those bubbles. So, like, I look at those people, and I'm like, I, how do we get those people to calm down? Like, these people left their homes and risked jail time to do what? Hmm. What were they doing that day? What was the motive? I don't understand even the thought process about the motivation. Like, what are we fighting for? What's the message? I think they thought it was a revolution against the corrupt. They think that everything has been bought out by the corrupt other side. And so then that's their moment to stand up and say enough is enough or whatever. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, I think when, I think online, everything is just so heated at mm-hmm. all times and i do think having my parents as i think my parents are probably from um talking i think my parents are probably a bit more um calm and my parents are actually mm-hmm. kind of like conflict avoidant like they don't uh, really like okay. arguing about things they yeah. they would more just rather we like okay let's we don't need to argue about politics right now oh, let's okay, just kind okay. of keep things calm um but yeah i mean i can't i just can't like 
my parents have political beliefs on the complete other side of the spectrum, but I can't just like label them bad people because yeah. I don't see them as bad people. Like my, um, my dad has a, um, he works, he's a professor and he has this mm. program in the university to try to like, um, give more opportunities to like black students within the university, which like, that's not really congruent with what you would usually consider like a yeah. conservative doing. Yeah, that's um, great. And I'm like, that's a really cool thing. And I, I see that you guys are just trying to be the best you can be within yeah. this moral framework of the Bible that you have here. So I just, I don't know. That's what it is. I, no, I, my, mm -hmm, please. Yeah. I, ca I can't bring myself to be like, my parents are terrible, awful people, you know? Yeah. No, my dad's a businessman. And so I, I come from the like capitalistic, like run a business, make millions of dollars. And my dad was, my mm -hmm. parents are successful. They're like about to celebrate their 30 years in business and they fed 10 kids and house a lot of families. But my dad did this thing in his business where he'd be like, we need to, you know, he'd, he'd be very like employees, like our employees, it is what it is. But then his employees would come to him and be like, yo, I, could you like, I need to pay my rent or I need to like buy a house. And like, I don't know what to do here. Can I get like, can you help me out here? And my dad would be like, oh yeah, we'll give you like a loan to buy your house and then you just pay me back. But I know you have kids. So like, I'll help you out. And I'm like, what are you doing? You socialist? You just giving money to people? Yeah. Like you just giving out money to people? And then he was like, uh, like people could take days off. Like people could call in. Like they could call. Like my dad was such a, he's such a compassionate employ employer. He's, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, like, this is what we're just saying. We're just saying you should be considerate of your employees. Like that's what we want from Amazon and all these places. But then they don't see it when they talk about Amazon. They're like, that's just the job. And I'm like, but that's, yeah, not peeing for 12 hours is just the job. I've I've heard. Have you ever heard people talk about before, like the smaller the bubble gets, the more closer to like communism it is like within your within yes. your own household. It's like you share everything with your partner and and you aren't you would never be like, oh, sure, I'll clean the dishes. But only if you give me, uh, you know, twenty dollars to do it, you know, <laughs> my living wage. <laughs> I'll do you one. I'll do you one even more. My mom calls me. She goes, Betty, get on this health insurance plan. It's really cool. I call them up. It's called Solidarity. Have you ever heard about it? Mm -mm. It's a Christian, not healthcare system. It's a everyone puts in money a month and then when people need the help they get the money and i was like oh kind of oh. like socialized healthcare." <laughs> i was just like i was like you are it's not even a healthcare. so it's like i'm like y'all are putting money into a pot and then yeah. using like distributing <laughs> it as people need it yeah literally i was like okay so this but bigger and they're like oh no that won't work bigger i was like fine this but statewide and they're like too big and i'm like fine this but yeah, city big. it's like fine then how small do i have to get it down so we can implement it Mm -hmm. How small do we have to get so we can implement it? Let's do it. Yeah. And that's the irony. It's, it's like. Mm. Yeah. But it's I, I do see people saying like when you try to make it bigger, it can open up to like, you know, people have of course. people want to take advantage. Then there's always going to be yeah. the people who come in and you have to be careful about that. But of course, yeah, humans are going to be human, dude. Like, yeah. There's I always going to be the people who ruin other. it. I think you know what it is. Yeah. I want. Uh, uh, see, that's so general. But like we, we want people to care. Somebody said this to me, like, oh, I just want people to treat me the way they want to be treated. And I was like, a lot of people want to be treated in ways I don't want to be treated. So yeah, I want yeah. people to be OK with just doing the bare Some minimum. Some people want to be pissed on, you know? Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had that happen a couple times. But like, <laughs> the point is, is that I just want I want people to think. I want people to really assess whether or not they have a threat in front of them and act accordingly. And I think a lot of people have trauma they haven't resolved. A lot of people have lived experiences that were hurtful. A lot of us were raised in environments where we feel consistently on edge because of the way we were raised. And if we can work on ourselves, maybe we can start being compassionate, suffering with, which means to suffer with. Compassion means to suffer with. And I can't suffer with all people, Ryan. I don't understand all people's struggles, but I'll do my best to suffer with the people I can understand. And then hopefully we can all be like assigned naturally to the people we can help and gravitate towards. I think that's why... I do believe if you're out here trying to help people, you eventually will. But if the wrong person hears it, it might cause unnecessary harm, which I think is unavoidable. But I think if we work on really, oh, this person isn't for me, maybe that would be a little bit better too. Because there's not a universal answer for all of us. So my theory is like if we could just pick up tools that are actually made for us instead of the tool that was given to us by the construct, we can actually succeed in joy. But you have to first decide, are you going to challenge that construct? Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part. You lose a lot yeah. by challenging the construct, right? You could lose everything, community, job, everything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you can hard. lose the people. You can lose the people in your community supporting you, and and it is a lot to ask of someone to yeah take that moment of self reflection when they are feeling that kind of trauma response or that like fear response to say like let me sit with this and really yeah. reflect on this and see like is this person really trying to hurt me or can we like come to some sort of agreement where we can actually like work together on this? You know? Yeah, I hope that as. I don't think it will – I think we'll only get better in smaller communities. But I think the online discourse, I think some of the comments I get, honestly, I'm so glad I'm prepared now for them. But they are pretty awful. And I have to assume the people that are sending them, I don't know what they're going through or what their life is like. Maybe they're perfectly happy. But, like, if they – it's really hard to read them sometimes. But I – also, as long as you don't hurt me, as long as you don't dox me or come to my home, I get it. Live and let live. I get it. I – sort of. <laughs> but I – Okay, that's my my really, concern right now. I'm really trying to get better at when there's someone who just completely misrepresented what oh. I was trying to say or completely <laughs> the the worst is when someone will be like um what you were saying would have made sense if you were actually saying this and I'm like I was saying that. That's what I was saying the whole time. <laughs> Literally, people have been like, Brittany, this is how it works. I was like, that's what I just said. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but you said it in a way that I didn't understand. I was like, okay, that's true. I don't think we can universally speak to people. Like I always, I had this fantasy when I was a younger YouTuber where I was like, I just need to make the most amazing video that can hit 8 billion mm. people and I can change the world. Yeah. As if I have this universal language that everyone's going to understand me. Yeah, that's that's something I run into. I'm like, I just want to make the perfect video and yeah. everyone on every side of the spectrum is going to be like, wow, that is so logical and it makes so much sense. And we're all on your side now. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. I think um, um, going to therapy helped me realize I wasn't going to save the world, but I could start with myself. Yeah. And see if I could help yeah. people, you know? I don't, I don't think I'm going to save the world. I think all I can do is... It, it it is really cool when I have those people reach out and say like, hey, I hadn't thought about that in that way. That's really yeah. all that you can do. You can't expect that you're going to dismantle these massive communities or systems and cause them all to just instantly take your side. But there are people who are more in the middle and more open to hearing what you have to say who might be For like, sure. wow, that's a really good point and kind of move in your direction. And that's why I, I don't agree with like the leftist idea of like just push everyone away who's not mm. on our side because- I used to not be on your side, but because there were people who were willing to like talk to me and empathize with me. Now Absolutely. I am on your side. So let's like get more of those people over here, you know? Absolutely. And a major, you know, props to every community that's trying their best, because I think that's all I can ask for anyone to do. I really do. I feel like asking too much or more than that is too much, but I am excited. I really, I really appreciated watching a lot of your videos today and just realizing like, holy crap, right now I'm kind of like, are similar enough that I'm like, oh, we could vibe like in a real way. And so I hope you you felt good through this like podcast, even if mm -hmm. an hour of it didn't get recorded. Yeah. Have what, you been having a good time? Your... Yeah, no, this is okay, a great good. conversation okay, good. for sure. <laughs> okay, good. Um, what, what what was your like original interpretation of me? Because I'm curious, like mm. it, it, it just feels mm. like the general vibe on like Twitter is that a lot of people see me as <laughs> something that I feel like I'm not actually. And I want to like, I don't know, I want to, come across more like I actually am, you know? Okay, so I'll be, I'm going to be very frank. Yeah. I sometimes am perplexed by the tweet wars you get into, but also yeah. I've been so tempted by them myself. I'm like, bro. So then a part of me is like, well, I've watched Ryan's stuff and I know that they're considerate and I know that they're thoughtful. So why yeah. would they be less thoughtful on Twitter? And then I was thinking, mm -hmm. oh, because in the same way that I think my thoughts and sometimes I want to tweet it, Ryan might just be engaging in those thoughts. But I think that the person that you are doesn't always get to shine through those moments because that other part of our brain that interacts with Twitter brings out the ugliest side of us that I think that's all people want. Like you said earlier, people thrive on the drama. And it's true. Mm -hmm. Like people were telling me, um, uh, there goes Britney's career. She's burning bridges. Like. That's what she gets for, like, doing all X, Y, and Z. And it's funny because, like, I've always had a career. Why would it matter now? And then I realized, like, oh, they yeah. see me as this creation because of this thing, but not the person mm -hmm. that I've been this whole time. So I think that the way that I they see, see you. through their lens. Yeah. Right. So when I saw you through mine, I saw you as a progressive content creator 
who was trying to do their best, but was very, very fair. So fair. Mm. So f- fairer than I can name a few leftist essayists who I love that I don't think they're as fair as you are. But I think that on mm. Twitter, you come off mean. Yeah. But so do I. So I'm like, no judgment. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right about that. I think, um, and I, I think in my head, I'm like, I want to give all this nuance and all this, like, um, me giving you all the explanations of why I understand what you're saying, Yeah. but all I have is this amount of characters. And so, and then, yeah, it's also like when I'm feeling attacked, it, it doesn't feel like, let me reach out in all of branch and empathy because right. I'm like feeling yeah, I don't know. I just yeah. feel like I, I don't like the version of myself that I feel like I'm pro- projecting on Twitter. Honestly, well, I've been trying like to I... have because because you you talk a lot about <clears throat> like um, self reflection, right? Or yeah. self uh, being introspective. Yeah, and I'm I'm like, is the person I'm being on Twitter really representing what I'm trying to like do and what I'm trying to accomplish? And I think the answer is probably. No, but it's like I I believe in the th- ideas I'm trying to promote on Twitter, but then it's like if I'm just getting into a shit flinging contest with someone, it's like what yeah. is what is how is the world being helped by this? You know, I I um that that you know how I told you that I don't like myself on live shows. I realize I engage in like that pettiness, and then I don't like like even myself on Twitter. Sometimes I'm like, what are you doing? But then I realize like. I could safely in my safe space with my family, I could be that version of myself and they would never, they would always know that I, I'm a good person and that I intend well and that this is just like, oh, you're being petty. Like, oh, you're being like, oh, you're like trying to snap back. Right. But the people on Twitter don't know that version of me. They don't know my content. They don't know how many different people I've spoken to and been, you know, whatever with. So they just have that interaction. Someone wrote me on Twitter and it really pissed me off. Like it made me livid. I was just like, I'm going to murder everybody. He was like, because of your bubble theory and your levels, you're promoting basically like our word, like assault on people. Like you are promoting that people should tolerate all. And I'm like, what? And I was like, no, I'm what? Like, I was so upset at this narrative that I was like, this is this. Is this how people see me? And I was like, so upset. And then I was like, My audience knows that's not true. They know I'm a victim. They know I've talked about this. But like that narrative, the idea that Britney would be a R word apologist is like. And you and you in that moment, you want to like say you want to like fire back at them. So, oh, my gosh. So hard. So I want to be like, um, like, oh, the worst words come out of my mouth. (laughs) I also thought it was so weird that like uh, Mr. Girl, like he always talked about like he's like. I want to empathize with everyone. I want to empathize even with Nazis. And then he comes on to your show and he's like, you're running a sex cult. I'm like, or a, a, what, I a thought I was so confused. Can said. I tell you, I completely misread him and I was so excited for that conversation. I thought we were kind of like flirting or something. I didn't know. Was, I don't know if my neurodivergency <laughs> got in the way of me reading the room, but I was like, is this a joke? Like, I was like, what is going on? I mean, like I think being... he has a weird, he has like a weird flirty energy with like everyone, but it's Bro. like a very strange. Yeah. I don't understand. It I don't, I don't know, but that idea, or even the fact that even some of my most extreme leftist friends have been like, hey, I saw you kind of agree with Jordan Peterson about one or two things, literally one or two things. And they're like, are you like a white nationalist now? And I was like, I was like, y'all, yeah. please, you're giving me anxiety. <laughs> like, I'm getting, What is this? So again, I think I, that's why I love this conversation so far. And like your energy and even your videos, like there's something very based about your energy to me but again i don't understand why i like you i like papa gut i like sneeko i like all these people and i'm like why do i get along with all these people but they don't get along with each other what the fuck is happening why Uh why is that happening i don't get it well like i've said i i feel like at the core of sneeko there is someone who feels like they are seeking truth and Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. want to like find what is like best for people it's just i feel like he's gone down the complete wrong direction whereas at the core of andrew tate it feels like it's a grifter who's trying to make money but yeah the core of sneeko it doesn't feel like that yeah um and yeah i think sneeko has like hurt a lot of people and i don't like i don't necessarily like him or the path that he's taken but i feel something at his core that's different than what i feel at like andrew tate's core 
Yeah, I agree with that. I think so too. I'm holding on to that. I'm not going to live for his potential because that's not what you should do. But I'm going to hope for that potential and I'm going to do my best to nurture it because I do think there's something about him that could potentially lead him to being a really amazing voice for future generations that don't cause more chaos between the groups. Like I'm trying to be more cohesive. And I think if we could figure it out between the two of us, like him and I, then maybe we can extend that further. If you and I can figure it out or if me and Papa Gut or me and so and so, like the moment we don't talk is the moment that like there's no reason for us to ask people to get along. I just feel that, but have boundaries, be open, say, I like you, but you know, when I'm with you, it doesn't bring out the best in me. Is it okay if we don't hang out as much or at all? Like, I'm okay with yeah. that kind of conversation versus you're bad and evil and I couldn't even imagine being with you. It's like, hey, bro, you yeah. know, I just feel like we're better at a distance. Yeah. And then, you know? yeah, I think this is, a, this is the last thing I'll say. Yeah, I mentioned this before we got cut off, but I think, um, yeah, it is, it is a yin yang. It's, mm. um trying to find that balance of reaching out and empathizing and trying to make connections and working together, but still like keeping your safe, uh, keeping yourself safe and protecting yourself against the people who really are trying to hurt people and trying yeah. to figure out, you know, how to keep us safe from people passing laws that are trying to make, take away our freedoms and take yes. away the things that can make us live our lives. So it's like, what is that balance? I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I think yeah. that's some, uh, a kind of a journey every person has to go on for themselves, you know? I agree with that. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on and dealing with the tech issues and winging it it's and being, good. you're such good energy. I really appreciate it. I hope you have the most fantastic day and I hope we do this again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Da 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 da